Well, we're going to get right into the word this morning together. And I do want, just before we do, though, I want to say one more thing. You know, Marilyn mentioned that uh, a lot of people have had a tough time. Kayla, or, you know, um, uh, uh, Craig's father passed away this week. And a lot of people have been going through some difficult times. So, you know, we just need to always remember that uh, uh, in, in the, in the I, I've never been, I've, I've never ceased to be amazed at how, at how big a problem some little things are in people's lives when contrasted to what other people are going through, you know? And we need to always be aware, even when we're thinking, you know, wow, man, I've had a tough week, you know, my rent was late, you know, I didn't have any gas money Tuesday and Wednesday or whatever, you know? We need to be remembering that all the time that all around us there are people that are really dealing with, you know, with some difficult issues in life. And uh, we just need to be asking the Lord. When we're unaware of things, we need to be asking the Lord on a daily basis. You know, Marilyn and I, we sit down to pray in the mornings, now, which admittedly we weren't able to do as much when we had a house full of people. There was always, always some interruption. But now that we're alone, we're able, we're able to once again go to our back porch or go to our living room and sit and pray for the, for the church and, and just um, pray in general as the Lord leads. And that's one of the things we do is we just ask the Lord, you know, to, to pray through us for, for those of you that may be difficult, experiencing difficult times that we're unaware of. And, you know, a lot of times people are uh, going through stuff and you're not aware of it until it's too late. And so, you know, why don't we just uh, take up that attitude? We're family here and, um, and you know, we're, we're, we're part of a huge family of the body of Christ. We're just a small portion of it. We're a localized portion of the body of Christ. But, you know, we need to all be sensitive to it. it. Church is not, as I was telling one man this week, you know, church is not about gathering here on Sunday morning to hear me talk. Church is about living, you know, living the life seven days a week, being, being sensitive to one another and being a, a participating in one another's needs as well as one another's joys. And, you know, too often that's been left to, in tradition, that's been left to the, the, the paid professional up front. Well, thank God you don't pay me much, so you can't leave as much to me. So, <laughs> but anyway, you know, it's just, um, so we've gone through some, people have gone through some tough times this week. Jenny is improving. Jenny's getting much better. Uh, that's good news. Um, you know, there's a lot going on. And like I said, uh, Doug will be getting out of, released tomorrow, out of the hospital tomorrow, and, and different things going on. So just kind of keep these uh, this people that, we're, that we are aware of in your prayers and be thanking God for them all the time. It's good to have this beautiful young lady back. Would you go to Mexico? Yeah, sure. She goes to Mexico. They go to California. Gee, we stay here. Praise God. You feel so, are you feeling sorry for me yet? Praise God. All right, you know, it heats up in here fast, so let's get into the Word together this morning. If you'd open your Bibles with me once again to Romans chapter 9. And we're not going to read the whole thing this time. Last week we read uh, verses 1 through 26. And we covered a lot of ground in Romans chapter 9 last week with the promise that I was going to wrap it up this week. Now, many of you that are here this week were not here last week and vice versa. You know, there's some people that were here last week that aren't here now. And so I'm, I'm not going to make any apologies for the fact that some of what I'm going to say may not make much sense to you or may leave you kind of out in the dark. The only word I have for you is archive. Archive. And maybe of all of the messages that I've taught, since this is a one particular message broken in two, this might be the most important one for you to find some way this week that you can go back and devote one hour of your time to listening to my message from last week in order to make sense of this one. And vice versa, I would say to those people who were here last week and won't be here this week, that maybe they should go back and, and devote some time and get this. Because really and truly, this is a, pa a passage of Scripture, a chapter that, you know, as we talk about what about the judgment of God, there really isn't a lot that really speaks to the judgment of God in this passage of Scripture, the way that uh, evangelical and fundamentalism and Catholicism and charismatic Christianity has presented the judgment of God. But there are indeed some things here that have influenced the way, the, pe the way people believe about the judgment of God. And so that's the reason I decided to take this chapter on as we attempt to eventually wind down on this series, uh, which is now 25 weeks long. And um, 25 hours of the best listening you could possibly do. You know, it, it is true, because I remember when we first began, you know, Marilyn and I first began our journey years ago together, that, it, you know, we just could not listen to enough. 
Now, admittedly, some of the stuff we listen to we've since discarded or since realized maybe was a little bit misleading or maybe even greatly misleading. But, you know, we devoted a great deal of time, in spite of raising f- uh, four, five children at that time, you know, having five children at that time, that in spite of that, you know, we devoted a great deal of time to listening to tapes and things like that and uh, trying to develop some understanding of the goodness of God. Fortunately, God had us going in that direction right away, not trying to understand, you know, the last days or the judgment of God or those kind of things from that, from that negative perspective that most of us are familiar with. But God was very uh, generous to us, I think, in the beginning, by suggesting to us that we just pursue the goodness of God. And so uh, I'm, glad he, I'm glad that we followed that path. But you know, there's so many people that keep coming up with questions. Now, not here, not from this congregation, but you know, I know that there are people that are with us on the web and that will listen to one, uh, one, one of the messages in this series or maybe in some other series I've done, uh, but, but then call, call or email or you know, message me somehow and say, yes, but you, and no, I've already taught on that. You just haven't heard about it because you haven't been willing to go and listen. Now, again, I'm not saying everybody needs to listen to absolutely everything I've said, but a lot of the questions that people still are having, I mean, 25 weeks into this thing, I've answered a lot of questions from the Word of God. You know, and again, not that my answers are the final answers, and I never want you to get the idea that I believe that what I tell you out of these things is the only thing to be found in there. Yeah, that's one of the problems we get into. We begin to think that somebody has the clear picture, uh, all of the picture, on some particular subject or even some particular verse, and nothing could be further from the truth. The Word of God is such a wonderful, wonderful, continuously uh, self-revealing, unveiling uh, masterpiece, you see, the Scriptures are, and... And, and so we need to understand that, you know, even when we want to put confidence in our pastor and his teaching, well, you know what, you can take what you, got, which, what you get from me or from anybody else that's teaching, but please understand that that's not the whole picture ever. God hasn't given me a complete revelation on what about the judgment of God, and yet I've, you think, well, my goodness, you must have. You've been teaching on it 24 weeks, 25 weeks with, with no promise of an end in sight. <laughs> Well, that's because I keep as, asking, presenting things that create more questions in me, which shows how little I really know about the judgment of God. But anyway, I don't want to kind of completely undermine my teaching now by talking that way, but I do want you to understand that there's been a lot said that I believe would help a lot of people if they would just be willing to take the time and go listen, see? So anyway, as I said, we got a, did, dealt uh, in a lot of detail with the first maybe 18 verses of this passage of Scripture last week and uh, this ninth chapter of Romans. And I'm not going to go back over all of it by any means, but I'm going to have to reemphasize just a few things, even for those of you that were here, because in order to complete what we started, I want to emphasize some things that I believe are necessary to your understanding for today, even for those of you that were here last week. So if you go with me just to verse 6... <clears throat> But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are Israel. And I'm not going to deal with everything I dealt with last week at all. Here's what I want you to see first of all, though, is that verse 6 sets the tone for this whole chapter with these words. And I'm going to make it a statement. Uh, The word of God, as it says here, the word of God has taken effect. As I said to you last week, this statement sets the tone for the whole chapter. The Word of God. Who is the Word of God? Jesus. Jesus has taken effect. Has taken effect. Now, throughout this passage, the part that we've already dealt with, we've seen that Paul tells us that the purpose of God from before the beginning of time, before before time began, was expressed to Abraham as the word of the promise in time and was revealing the seed, the word of God. So when we say the purpose, the promise, and the seed, we're really saying, making a synonymous statement. So this passage is about the purpose, the promise, who is the seed, and his effect upon humanity. The word of God, the seed, the word of the promise, the purpose of God from before time began is in fact (laughs) that word which has taken its effect upon humanity. And its effect has been upon all humanity. And again, some of that you're going to have to go back and get because we saw here that there were uh, that there were some scriptures that we've been taught to read some things into that when we look, it took a new and fresh look at them, we realized, wow, we've been reading this thing completely inverted from what it was intended for us to see here. Um, 
That's encouragement to go back to the archive. Anyway, so anyway, th this, this entire passage that we're dealing with here in Romans chapter 9 is ultimately about the all-inclusive function of the seed, the word of the promise, see, upon humanity's uh, genealogy, as I said last week, you know, embracing all mankind as the children of God. And, you know, there's, a, there's such resistance to this, all mankind as the children of God, because, you know, there was a time when we heard those things, and it was coming from, you know, the hippie generation, or from people who, were, who were, had a, a generic meaning for that, not a specific meaning for that. They didn't really understand it in light of the Word of God. And so we had a resistance to understanding all humanity as the children of God. But the truth of the matter is, that's what Paul is revealing uh, to be the effect of the Word of God, is the revealing feeling and the embracing of all humanity as the children of God. And as we've discovered over the years, the scripture certainly unfolds in, and declares that to us. Every family in heaven and on earth, right? Every family in heaven and earth. I think that's Ephesians 3.15. What was the promise that the, that the word of promise began with? Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3. In you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Not most of the families or the confessing families or the Jewish families or the Gentile families or the Baptist families or the Methodist families, but all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you, in your seed. His seed, of course, he understood to be Isaac, but we understand the seed to be Jesus Christ, as Paul tells us over in the book of Galatians as well. So anyway... As I said, this entire passage then is really about, ultimately about the all-inclusive function of the seed, embracing and revealing all mankind to be the children of God. Now, we also saw last week, I'm going to race through some of this, we also saw last week, you know, that there were some in exclusive interpretations that we have been predisposed to. To, to read here, and that these inclusive or exclusive interpretations that we've been taught to hear in certain of these passages are antichrist. They're antichrist. They're actually anti the effect of the word of God. Remember, verse 6, the word of God has taken effect. That means that the incarnation has been successful, fully successful. The purpose of God planned before time began, his purpose and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, that purpose has taken effect. That purpose which was expressed to Abraham in the word of the promise, in thee all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That promise, see, which was, a, was, a, was a, a, an expression of the purpose, has taken effect. And that promise was the seed. The seed was the word of God. Jesus has taken effect. That's what we've got to carry with us throughout this whole passage, right? Now, additionally, we discovered, and again, I'm not going to go over all of this, but we discovered that Paul's purpose in verses 13 through 15 here, which have been kind of, you can put them up there for people to see as I'm talking, but verses 13 through 15, which have traditionally been kind of confusing passages of Scripture, difficult to deal with uh, for some people. We saw that Paul's purpose in, in, in these was to refute was to refute the idea entirely of Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. How did he do that? By revealing that Malachi the prophet had been <laughs> mythologically influenced by the pagan religions around him and declared some things because not only did that passage began, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated, and I'll refer again to how that came about in just a moment. But, and then it goes on and talks about how, how God, you know, burned down Esau's mountain and how they might build again, but uh, God, you know, would strike it down again. In other words, the entirety of Malachi's message there was really a message of retribution, of don't cross this God of Israel because he'll burn your mountain down, right? If you don't from sin retire, he'll set your fields on fire. That was an old song. Isn't that a good song? If you don't from sin retire, he will set your fields on fire. Wow, where did we get that garbage, huh? <laughs> anyway, so as I said, though, but, but Paul had an intention here in these verses 13 through 15, and that was to expose the fallacy of Malachi's prophecy that Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. And so consequently, what Paul was able to do there was to further emphasize the all-inclusive, you know, victory of Jesus Christ, the word of God, the seed. 
where we read that verse and we get somewhat confused about who it is that God hates and who it is that God loves and how that applies to us today and blah, 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 blah. And so we can't maintain any continuity throughout this chapter. We say, well, the word of God has taken effect. Well, only on the Jacobs, not on the Esau's. Hey, all right. Now, the overriding message of this chapter, if it'll allow me, the overriding message of this chapter is the mercy of God that is revealed in the purpose, the promise, and the seed having its effect on all of humanity. Verse 15, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy. That's like God saying, I'll do what I want to do and you won't tell me what I'll do. Okay, I mean, I'm going to say it like that. Because again, we try to read that differently. We try to read that I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy and on the rest I'll have retribution. But no, God's just saying, I'll have mercy on whomever I want to have mercy. You're not the boss of me. Religion, you're not the boss of me. Humanity, you're not the boss of me. I'll be merciful to whomever I want to be merciful to, and you won't change me. So that's verse 15. Verse 16 said, it's not of, you know, not of him who runs or him who wills, but of God who, what, shows mercy. And we talked about that last week. When you look to God, if you're not seeing mercy, you're looking to the wrong God. You're not looking to the Abba of Jesus. You're not looking to the Father of Paul. You're looking to a God that religion has taught you to look to that does not show mercy. Because what shows when you look at God is mercy. And then verse um, 18. Therefore he has mercy on whomever he wills. Once again. Verse 23. That he might make known. Now verse 23 was the only verse that we really took on beyond verse 18 last week. And so I'm reading it once more time here. But that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had prepared beforehand for glory. So we have right there as I said the overriding message of this entire chapter is the mercy of God having its effect on all of humanity humanity as a result of the effect of the word of God. It was the purpose, the promise, and the seed that enabled man to understand the mercy of God. And then we concluded our work in this chapter last week by recognizing God's purpose for Pharaoh. Because boy, has religion ever screwed up God's purpose for Pharaoh. See? So we realized that God's purpose for Pharaoh was to be a vessel of mercy through which Yahweh would bless not only Pharaoh and Egypt, but would bless Israel and then all of the world through him. God's purpose for Pharaoh was not destruction. God did not want to destroy Egypt and Pharaoh. What God desired to do was to bless Pharaoh and Egypt, first and foremost, so that he could be merciful towards them in the same way to raise him up in mercy, the same way that he had raised up the Pharaoh of Joseph's day. See, Joseph's day had great mercy upon him, and he recognized it, and he ex extended it to Joseph, and he extended it to Joseph's family when they came down, and so on and so forth. See, well, this was God's plan for Pharaoh, but religion says, you know, if you look at that verse, for the scripture says, verse 17, to, the, to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth, and we have basically learned, at, at least uh, subversively, we have learned that God said, this is the reason I raised you up, to cut you down. I raised you up to cut you down so that the nations would fear me so that the nations would understand that this is the way I deal with people that don't worship the way I want them to worship. Some form of that is what religion has taught us to believe. But what was God saying? He said, for this very purpose, for this very purpose, what purpose? Verse 23, I'm not going to read it again. We talked about it last week. The purpose that God might use him to show his mercy upon the, I mean, to show his glory upon the vessels of mercy. He said, I want to show my power in you in a wonderful way, in a good way. Not in a destructive way, say, <clears throat> that my name may be declared in all the earth. Now, that, that my name may be declared in all the earth was the problem. This was the thing that, that brought about the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. We read this verse, and again, we've been taught to read this verse, as that God actually did something himself to harden Pharaoh's heart, that it was God's will to harden Pharaoh's heart in order to justify wiping Egypt out, in order to justify, you know, well, you didn't respond to me because I hardened your heart, but you didn't respond to me, and now I'm going to take you out and I'm going to show the world how powerful I can be against those who would reject me, see? 
That's kind of the way. Again, I'm, I'm being a little bit extreme in the way I'm saying some of these things, but I'm just trying to call to your attention the kind of the foolish way we've read these things because of the way we've been indoctrinated, right? But what God really said, as we saw, was that, that my name may be declared in all the earth, and that word declared means to be inscribed and celebrated. God said, this was my purpose for you, say, my purpose was, was for you to, to follow my purpose, which is expressed here, that the purpose of God may stand in verse 11, and he explains that purpose in verse 23. Say, that, that, that this was my purpose for you. This is the very purpose for which I raised you up, that my mercy might be dispersed. See? And, and that my name, now here's where we got a conflict of interest. We got Yahweh talking, and we got Pharaoh talking, or Pharaoh listening, and Pharaoh is listening to Yahweh, and Pharaoh is, as he's listening to, to Yahweh, what he's hearing, what he's thinking is, now wait just a minute, I am the embodiment of the gods of Egypt. That's who I am. That's who Pharaoh was. He was the embodiment of the multiple gods of Egypt. Now, Egypt was the greatest nation on the earth at that time. Pharaoh was the greatest name upon the earth at that time, the name to be feared. And so when God says that my power may be displayed in you and that my name might be declared in all the earth, what God said was, I want my name to be inscribed and celebrated in all the earth. And Pharaoh said, wait just a minute. Who is God here? See, it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Not God taking action against Pharaoh, but the idea that crossed his heart, who is God here? I think it's me. Remember? I think it's me. And so he began to defend his own darkness. Yahweh revealed himself in peaceable ways. Cast down that rod, it becomes a serpent. Ah, we can duplicate that because you see, Yahweh, you're talking to Pharaoh. I'm the God of Egypt. See, I'm the God of the whole powerful world. Conjurers, sorcerers, boom, more serpents. Ah, Yahweh speaks one more time. His serpent swallows up all the rest. So Yahweh has been peaceable, except for the destruction of a few snakes. Who cares about that, right? That's one place we will accept violence going forward. Snakes and poisonous spiders. But anyway... <laughs> But, but, but at any rate, so Yahweh has spoken peaceably. He has revealed himself. And, in, and in, his, in this revelation, you see, Pharaoh is confronted with what is his own darkness, but he's not going to admit to it. He begins to defend his darkness, and that's how our hearts become hardened. And as I said last week, it amazes me how, what, what a Pharaoh response, a response is being elicited by this, menis, by this message of inclusion. The, the, the mixture people are rising up as Pharaoh, and they're beginning, they defend in their darkness. And as they defend their darkness, more and more their hearts become hardened to the revelation of the inclusive work of the Lord Jesus Christ. See? So we, we don't want to have that Pharaoh response. But anyway, I don't want to get back into that again. But I want you to understand God didn't do anything to harden Pharaoh's heart except reveal to him who was true God of true gods. See? And Pharaoh said, I'm having none of that. I'll show you who the true God is, say. And so he began to defend his darkness, and that's how hardening of the heart comes about. Hardness of heart is not based on just ignorance. Ignorance is just ignorance. That's all it is. You don't know what you don't know. That's not hardness of heart, say. All right, so anyway, now we're down to verse 19. And again, all of that was covered in more detail. You said, that's quite a bit of detail right there. No, nah, not anywhere near what I talked about last week. But now we go to verse 19, and we're going to start afresh. Uh, not afresh. We're going to attach this to last week. You will say then, uh, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault for who has resisted his will? Remember that comes on right after he said, therefore he has mercy on whom he will, and whom he wills he hardens. Right? Now, anyway, so, but this statement here, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault for who has resisted his will? Now, this comes on the heels of, back in uh, verse 12, this comes on the heels of the older shall serve the younger, right? Which served to fuel the mistaken idea that Jacob he loved, but Esau he hated. Now see, one we showed to be truth. It was said to her, it was said to Rebekah, by God, the older shall serve the younger. And God had a plan for bringing that about peacefully, wonderfully, in order to demonstrate his redemption. But 
Of course, we know Rebecca got involved. Rebecca began to whisper things in Jacob's ear. First of all, she named him Jacob without asking God, and his name meant surplanter. His name meant one who, who, t- who takes by underhanded means. So she names him that. Instead of asking God, what should I name him then if the older shall serve the younger and this, this child I'm going to have and so on? She doesn't ask for that. And so, so, so the older shall serve the younger. God had a plan for that. Man manipulated God's plan, see? And as a, as a consequence of that, then what we have is we have uh, uh, the idea developing and growing within the Israelite nation. Well, Jacob he loved, Israel he hated. The Baptist he loves, the Presbyterians he's not so fond of. I mean, that's the way it is, you know. The Word of Faith people, the Pentecostal people, the Catholic people, whatever, this, that, or the other thing. One of us he loves, the other one he's not so sure about, right? Maybe he just downright hates the Mormons. Maybe he just downright hates the, you know, the the ones that we call cults. I mean, maybe he does, because my goodness, we're the ones he loves. Isn't that right? Better be shaking your heads no, not yes. (laughs) Right? But anyway, as I said, so, th- so this statement, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? Who has resisted his will? It comes on the heels, you know, of, of, of that, the older shall serve the younger, which was a true statement, though, but which was distorted in their understanding uh, to, went to where they began to understand Jacob he loved, but Esau hated. And it also comes on the heels of what he's just told us about the assumption or the presumption, or whatever the right word is, of what Pharaoh's intent, or I mean, what God's intentions were in his dealings with Pharaoh. Because, you see, Israel liked the idea that their God's intentions was to destroy Egypt. They'd been in bondage for 430 years. They were under harsh taskmasters, weren't they? And so Israel liked the story. It was a good story. God came down to Egypt, and his whole idea was, I'll show Pharaoh who God, who God is, and I'll destroy the Egyptians on my, on my way as I march through. See, that's the story that developed among the Israelites. See? So Paul's dealing with this. He's showing, them the, he's, he's, he's showing them the effect of the word of God, first of all, upon all of humanity. He's explaining to them the purpose, the promise, and the seed. And he's trying to bring all of this together in a way that exposes the fallacy of what they believed about Jacob and Esau, what they believed about God's intentions with Pharaoh. See? So after talking, he said, well, then he asked this question. You will say to me then, why does he still, found, st- still find fault, right? It, it, he's meaning in consideration of these previous events, the things I've just talked to you about in verses 12 through 18, he said, in consideration of these events, you will say to me then, because I've said something different to you than what you believe to be true. So then you will say to me, well, then why does he still find fault, right? Now, let me do this. Uh, let me read this to you. Uh, this, this verse out of the New Living Translation, which, by the way, I would never recommend as a study Bible. But every once in a while, it says something that I think might be helpful in interpreting or helping you understand more clearly what's being said. Now, the first part is easy, because it, New King James says, you know, why does he still find fault? New Living Translation says, why does God blame people for not responding? Well, that, that sounds pretty good. You can get that out of the New King James by itself. But then the next part is where he says, for who has resisted his will? The New Living Translation says this, haven't they simply done what, now listen to these words, what he makes them do? Hear that? Haven't they simply, why does he still find fault? Haven't they simply done what he makes them do? In other words, the assumption in this question, listen to me carefully, the assumption in this question is that God willed and orchestrated the strife and the deception between Jacob and Esau, that God was behind it, not Mama Rebecca, but that God was behind it, see, in order to establish his purposes. Have you ever heard anything like this in the Christian church in your life? That God orchestrates this, that, or the other thing that may may have turned out real ugly, but it was in order to accomplish his purposes, right? See? Oh, and also that God, you know, himself hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he could justify destroying Egypt, as I've already said. In other words, let me make it shorter. The question of sovereignty is being asked here. See? Why does God... How does it go? Why does God blame people for not responding? Haven't they simply done what he makes them do? See, so they're asking this question of sovereignty. Isn't everything that happens the doing of God? 
That sound familiar to anybody? Has anything in your past ever tried to communicate that message to you, whether you accepted it or rejected it? See, somewhere along the line, that's what you've probably been led to believe. That's what most of the people in the world believe. The ones who reject our, our, our Abba, the ones who reject our Jesus, the ones who have no interest in what we call the gospel, because the gospel they've heard is one in which God, everything that happens is, is God's doing, right? All right. All right, now let's read verse 20. But indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? All right. First of all, let me do this. King, New King James starts off, who are you to reply against God? But here's again, the New Living Translation says it this way. No, don't say that. Hasn't he just, aren't they just doing what he made them to do? No, don't say that. See? Now, that's a place where the New Living Translation got it right because, see, the New King James and several of the other versions use the word against in the first line. New King James says, who are you to reply against God? And the word against God there, or against there, means in contradiction to who God is. Who are you to speak? Who are you to reply in contradiction to God? In other words, saying, haven't they simply done what he makes them do? contradicts who God is in relationship to man. That makes sense to you? That's what Paul's saying. Hey, look, you're asking a question about sovereignty, accusing God of, of, of everything that you have imagined in your, in your uh, exclusive Israelite history, you know, as the people of God, the only people of God, the people who are to contain the word of God rather than spread it as was God's desire, say. And now you have begun to believe that everything that happens in this world is because of God, is, is, is God's doing. He said, no, don't say that. Don't say, that. who are you to reply in contradiction to who God really is in his dealings with man? Oh, wow, that's a slap in the face. Gentle, but it's a slap in the face, right? Then he says, huh, will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? Now, you know, people have gone all kinds of ways with this, type, with this passage right here, with these words right here. You know, why did you create me, to, to, you know, broke? Why did you create me? Whatever. But here's the thing we need to notice, first of all. Notice that this verse begins, but indeed, O oh man. O oh man is a, is a phrase that Paul uses when he is referring to humanity in general. He uses it early in the book of uh, Romans too. O oh man. Okay. He said, who are you, O oh man? You know, and so he's addressing humanity as a whole, not specific individuals. So he's not asking you and me and you and me and so on and so forth. He's not doing that. What he's saying is, who are you, humanity? See? He's making a big statement, all right? So in other words, in other words let me say it this way. Let me, let me phrase it. Will you mankind, see, he's talking about mankind. He said, will you mankind say, why have you crafted us in calamity, heartache, despair? Why have you made us as we are? In other words, it's your fault for the condition we're in. Now, that doesn't sound at all like Adam and Eve in the garden, does it? The woman whom you gave me, right? She said... And Eve said, well, the serpent said, see? So there was already this accusatory thing going on, right? And so Paul's just speaking to that again. He's saying, will you say, mankind, <laughs> why have you crafted us in calamity, heartache, despair? I just threw out some words there so you kind of get the idea there. Why have you made us as we are? A despairing, struggling people. A people who work all day in the garden and it brings forth thorns and thistles. See? Or chokeweed or <laughs> whatever you're dealing with. I got chokeweed that you can, if you want to buy some, I got some. Anyway, <laughs> but he's saying, will humanity say, you're at fault. And everything we do is because you make us do it. If we fail, it's because you made us fail. If we succeed, it's because you made us succeed. Listen, I can tell you, folks, how many times Marilyn and I sat in Sunday school classes in our first few years of marriage when we were still attending church as, as students rather than, you know, trying to be involved in leadership in a church. How many times we heard people say things that were just exactly that, wasn't it? You know, well, God had me fail because he's, God made me sick because he's, say, it's God, 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 did, 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 did. And he said, 
Wow, will mankind say, <laughs> you're at fault for our condition. Well, then now, here's where you've got to really start paying close attention. I know most of you have been listening to me already, but you've got to start paying attention. Because now we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna move into verse 21, and you're going to see here that once again, we've got some, as I said last week, reversing of bias to do. Because verse 21 <laughs> apparently, as you begin to read it, is justification of the human condition that he's just talked about. In other words, he says, does not the potter ha have power over the clay? And here's the way we've learned it. Listen to me carefully. Here's the way we've learned to understand that, generally speaking. We've learned it this way. I'll tell you why he made you this way. See, that's the, first, the question from the previous verse. Why have you made us this way? And then so apparently, Paul is going to justify that question. He's going to justify, he's going to say, well, I'll tell you why he made you this way. It's because he has power over the creation to give some good and some evil, some honor, some dishonor. And who are you to question your station in life? Who are you to question how he made you that way? Again, does that ring any familiar bells? See, I'll tell you why, right? <clears throat> but I want you to listen carefully to me now. Don't. Don't, don't hear verse 21 as extended commentary in support of the fallen, darkened perception that was communicated in the previous verse. Hear what I say? Because see, normally when we read that, that's what we do. We, we understand it to be extended commentary coming from Paul, answering the question for them, why have you made us this way? Well, it's because I have, I have power over the clay. That's who I am. I'm God. I'm sovereign. You've asked the sovereignty question. Here's your answer. I have power over the clay to make from one lump, or from some lump, one vessel for honor and another vessel for dishonor. That's who I am. See, so it seems when we read it the way we've been predisposed to read it, and that predisposition began clear back in verses 6, 7, and 8, not all who are Israel are of Israel. Not all who are of Israel are Israel. That predisposition, we talked about that last week. See, it started early as we had this passage of Scripture revealed to us in that old way to where we got to this point and we thought, well, yeah, I guess, what, you know, what, what can I do? He's got power. So whoever I am is who he made me to be and whatever I do is what he made me to do. If I fail, it's because God ordained my failure. If I succeed, it's because God ordained my success. You hearing me? Somebody say amen. amen. I just said somebody. I didn't say all of you, but anyway. <laughs> so as I said, don't hear verse 21 here as extended commentary confirming, you know, uh, in support of that fallen, darkened perception of sovereignty that just was spoken prior to that. But instead, hear it as a turning point in the conversation. Hear it as Paul saying, you're asking the wrong question. You've asked the question, why does God make us do the things we do, basically? You're asking that question. But here's the question you need to ask instead. And right now, it won't make too much sense to you because it seems like, you know, I'm not really, I'm not really changing much. But he said, you're asking the wrong question. You're asking, let me see what he's asking here. He's asking, why have you made us like this? Right? Why have you made us as we are? That's the question you're asking. They said, that's the wrong question. The question you need to be asking is, does not the potter have power over the clay or authority? Now, again, because of your predisposition, you're not seeing the difference in that yet. But he's saying, here's the different question. Here's the question you need to be asking. Does not the potter, okay, have power over the clay? So, what Paul's doing here, and let me explain this, and then we'll get more further, get more further, <laughs> further into it. It'll be more better. <laughs> Want to get more further into it? No. More clearer. <laughs> wow. In other words, here's the thing. Paul is asking a question that points towards the remedy rather than looking backwards to their, into their futility. See, rather than giving credence to the question, why are, as, why are we as we are, Paul intends, in what he's about to say, to silence the error of human thought and bring them back to, what? 
The word of God has taken effect. Bring them back to, hey, this, is, remember, is about the purpose, the promise, and the seed. That's what he's trying to recall. He, said, he starts talk, How many times do I start a conversation? You know, I start talking about something, and I get a few, a few uh, well, Marilyn would say a few chapters into it rather than a few sentences into it. And, and already I'm being misunderstood or, or we're, we're forgetting what we were talking about in the beginning. And so that's what Paul's doing. He's gonna, he's, he, this is a turning point in the conversation. And he's saying, you know, I'm not going to give any credence or any validity or my stamp of approval on the question you've asked. Instead, I'm going to ask you a different question for the purposes of guiding you towards the truth and away from the fiction. All right? So he intends to silence their error by, by bringing them back. So now here's the thing. When we dump our bias, which is what I'm hoping you and the folks that are with us online and the folks that will listen to this in the future, when we dump our bias this verse uh, of this verse, we discover something beautiful. And boy, you need this. We discover something beautiful. Now, I have referred many times to Isaiah 46.10, declaring the end from the beginning. My purpose will stand and I will do all my will, right? Now, we're going to see that play out right now before us in this passage. So, <clears throat> so we're going to discover something beautiful, something that's declaring the end from the beginning. Now, please remember who the beginning is. The beginning is not a historical date. It's not the record of the creation of the universe. The beginning is he who is called the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. In the beginning, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And without him, the Word was not anything made that was made. Declaring the end from the beginning. Declaring the way it will be when it all wraps up. See? From the way it was when it all began. From whom it began. Right? Right? All right, so as I said, I've used that a lot, but <clears throat> so we're going to discover that. Something that's declaring the end from the beginning, something saying, my purpose shall stand. That word means endure and be maintained, not fail. My purpose, what is his purpose? Well, his purpose and grace that was given us in Christ Jesus before time began, right? <laughs> All right, the purpose was expressed in the word of the promise, and the word of the promise was the revelation of the seed, and the seed has had his effect on humanity. Okay, so something saying, my purpose shall stand, and listen to these words again, I will do. This is what we're going to discover in this. That's why I'm emphasizing this again. This is what we're going to discover in this chapter, or in this verse, the potter having authority to make one vessel for honor and another vessel for dishonor. And we've had that so dis destro destroyed in its understanding. My purpose shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. So, again, what is it that the potter has the power or the authority to do. Let's just begin to break this down. Please be, you know, you, you ought to be, if you got a Bible, you should probably be writing in it to, you know, but anyway, here's what it says the, the potter has the power or the authority to do. From the same lump, very important words, from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor. Now, the first thing that this tells us, from the same lump to make one vessel for honor. So what this tells us is that the clay, <laughs> that, 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 is that the clay he begins with is good, usable clay, right? That's what it tells us, because it, it would not be to creating a vessel for honor and a vessel for dishonor out of unusable clay, Right? So when we say from the same lump to create one vessel for honor and one vessel for dishonor, the first thing we must realize is that this is a good, usable lump of clay that he begins with. Okay? So he can start with a good thing and he can make a... And again, remember, this is just a, a, an analogy that Paul's drive, drawn from anyway at the same time, right? All right, now, he's got a good lump of clay that he's beginning with. Good and usable. Now, again, keep in mind that this entire passage is about the effect of the word of God, Jesus, on humanity's condition. So that means that this verse that we're looking at right now has to reveal the effect, getting this? Has to reveal the effect 
of the word of God on, hu on the human condition or we're, we're putting something into it that doesn't belong there, which is exactly what we've done time and again, all right? And so he begins. Here's what he begins with. One vessel for honor. He starts with a lump of clay, a good lump, and he creates one vessel for honor. Psalm 8, 5 tells us that man in his original formation, there's that word form, it's not, that's not the word that's used in Psalm 8, 5, but we're talking about forming. Man in his original formation was crowned with glory and honor. There you go, right? One vessel for honor. Hmm, getting good, right? Now, I want you, also want you to look back at verse 21 here, and I want you to notice that this verse is about one and then another. Leave some of the other words out for just a minute for clarity of thought, clarity of recognition. This verse is about one and then another, right? Okay, just ignore the honor and dishonor momentarily. Verse is about one and then another. It's not about one and many. It's not about a whole bunch here and a whole bunch there. It's about one. And then another. All right. <clears throat> Humanity is always represented by one in Paul's redemptive presentation. And of course, the first one that humanity is represented by is Adam, right? Get me? And Adam was then created, formed initially, what? As a vessel of honor, wasn't he? We know what happened afterwards, but he's created, first of all, as a vessel of honor. Now, the same lump, <laughs> the same lump, we're told, yielded another, not many more, but another for dishonor. Right? Following me? So we got one that was formed for honor. Ah, thou hast crowned him with glory and honor. Psalm 8, 5. All right? Another for dishonor. And here's what we see in this another. It's a dual function of the word of God affecting the inclusion of humanity. Now, lump, you should have already figured this out, but lump here refers to what? Flesh, right? Lump refers to flesh, right? <clears throat> humanity has been identified or was identified uh, in the Old Testament as one whose name we've given Adam. We've called Adam, right? That's the one in whom all humanity was identified, Adam. And then there's another, all right? But now we're dealing with, you know, as I said, we're, we're looking at this another, and we're going to find in here, discover in here, a dual function of the seed, the word of God, having his effect upon all of humanity, all right? As I said, lump refers to flesh, and Adam was the first inclusive definition of all humanity. Adam is the O oh man that this verse began with. You know this, um, but indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Humanity he's talking about. He's not talking about Lloyd or Bruce or Mike or Marilyn. He's talking about humanity. Adam, right? We've already established that. So Adam is the, is the, uh, was the first inclusive definition of all humanity, the O man of this address. And then he becomes the, in Paul's redemptive presentation, he becomes through the one man. Sin entered the world and death through sin. Now, when you listen to that, do you hear that the ultimate dishonor is death, not sin? Because through one man, Adam, See, who had been originally created as a vessel of honor through one man, one lump, one lump of clay, okay, one man, sin entered the world and death through sin. Sounds to me like where God really wants to get with that statement is to death because death is the ultimate dishonor to the creation that God has created and said it is very good, right? Sin was not the ultimate dishonor. Death was, Right? need to have that. All right. <laughs> but then it goes on to say here, another for dishonor. Now listen to the definition of dishonor, this word here. It means infamy by comparison to honor. Dishonor means infamy by comparison to, to honor. 
right? It means less honorable than the original, okay? But here's the word we really want to focus on, infamy. Listen to what the word infamy means, because this is what's being communicated here. To be totally without reputation. If you would join me in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 7, I think you will be greatly, greatly encouraged about this verse in Romans. <clears throat> but made himself of no reputation. Did you hear that? That's what the word infamy means. That's what the word dishonor that's used there means. To be of no reputation. Made himself of no reputation, taking the, what? Form. From one, from the same lump to form. Genesis tells us God formed man from the dust of the ground. From the same lump to form, taking the form <laughs> of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men. Coming in what? In the likeness of men. What was the likeness of men when he came? Dishonor. Is that right? Honor had become dishonor. Adam had, grain, had gained infamy. <laughs> so in other words, here's what it tells us here, beginning with verse 7. He made himself dishonored. That's not the potter. See, going back to our thing now, as I said, it's a turning point. Paul says you're asking the wrong question. You shouldn't be asking the question... Why have you made us as we are? What you should be doing is asking this question. Let me, now, now I can rephrase it. Does not the potter have the power to change all this? Was not the potter, you know, way ahead of us in this? Does not he have the power, the authority to make from one, the same lump, one vessel for honor, Adam, who became death, dishonor? And we find here... <laughs> that he made himself dishonorable. Got it so far? All right, now let's keep going. Now, notice, uh, you don't stay here in Philippians, but we saw over there in Romans 9 that he said, from the same lump. Well, the word same is very useful to us too because this word is the Greek word autos. It looks like autos, A-U-T-O-S, autos. Okay, and uh, here's the interesting thing about this word. This word is almost exclusively translated himself, him, herself, her, themselves, them. But here it's translated same, but it's the same word. It's the word that means himself. So here's what we have. Stay here, but this is what we have now from over in Romans. He, referring to the potter, from himself, the flesh. You get that? He, from himself as flesh, that's same lump. Lump is flesh, same is himself. He, from himself as flesh, in the incarnation, made himself to be the vessel for dishonor. You hearing anything different in this? You hearing here that God has never created any man to experience dishonor? That God crowned man with glory and honor, and that's all the Father ever wanted for all human beings on the face of this earth. No matter how they've lived their life, he wants them to be honored. Honor, that's what he's created humanity for. Crowned him with glory and honor. We'll talk about glory in a second, but anyway. So he made himself. And then go on into verse 8, Philippians here. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even, or that word means also, also the death of the cross. So it actually talks about two deaths here. But, uh, but anyway... So let's just take this part out of verse 8 now. As a man, he humbled himself. Oh, there's that word autus again. Now, I'm going to overdo this, this word autus because I just want you to get the point of what's being said to there from the same lump. From himself as flesh is what he's saying over there in Romans. From himself as flesh. All right. As a man, he humbled autus himself and became obedient to death, the ultimate dishonor. But then it doesn't end there. It doesn't end there. See, again, Paul was providing an answer for them, a remedy. All right? Because he goes on in verse 9 and says, Therefore, God has highly exalted. And this means lifted up to the place of highest honor. Woo! See the cycle? Created, crowned with glory and honor, fell into dishonor. Came and of himself created a vessel for dishonor. 
to be exalted to bring humanity right back up to that place of honor. See the answer? See, there's the answer. That's a question you should have been asking. Not why have you made us the way we are. What you going to do about it? That's the answer. That's a question we should have been asking. See? What is he going to do about it? He didn't make us the way we are. We made ourselves this way. See? And now he's got an answer to fix it all. Isn't that awesome? You see how this still, no matter how we far we get away from verse 6, it still talks about the effect of the Word of God. The Word of God has had its effect. It is not as if the Word of God has not taken effect. Amen. All right. Wow. All right. And then he says, therefore, God has lifted him up to the place of high of honor and given him the name which is above every name that at the what? Name of Jesus. So again, we're just identifying here the word of the promise, the seed, the word of God that has taken effect upon all of humanity. Jesus, right? The name of Jesus. And then look it on down. Uh, you know that every knee shall bow, those in heaven, those on earth, those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to what? To the glory. Oh, there's that word glory now. To the glory of God the Father. Now, let me plug this back into, in fact, well, no, you don't need to go back there yet, but let me plug this back in there to the purpose of God as it was interpreted for us in Romans 9, 23, because it says to the glory of God the Father. Verse 9, chapter 9, verse 23, that he might make known the riches of his, uh-oh, there's autus again. But anyway, again, I'm overplaying it. Don't worry about that word. You don't need to write that down. His is the right way for that to be trained. That's all I'm showing you, that his and himself and himself, these are the words that that normally is translated. So there was something really hidden there from us that we found insane. That he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory. Hebrews 9, uh, chapter 2 and verse 10 says this, For it was fitting for him in bringing, listen to me carefully, the many sons to glory to perfect the captain of their salvation through suffering or through dishonor. You get it? So in other words, we have, we have the return to the crowning of glory and honor. It was fitting for him in bringing the many sons to glory. The many sons to glory. Wow. No. So, this is the, so this is the potter's declaration, as I said, of the, of the end from the beginning. Isn't that right? The word of God has taken effect. There's other places where we find this. Of him, 1 Corinthians 1.30, of him, atus. You are in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So here once we see the exaltation. We see the honor, dishonor, honor. That's what we're supposed to see in this. This is the question you should be asking. What has the Father done about the way you see yourself in your darkened perception, humanity? The way you understand your, your humanity to be. What has the Father done about it? Has he done anything about it? Yes, he has. The Father has power. Okay. Okay. So any, any suggestion that God made individual men, some purpose for honor, some for dishonor, you know, some for good, some for evil, so on and so forth, is, is totally, it's, it's, it's exclusive for one thing. It's exclusive. It demonstrates partiality, say, you know, it's loving one and hating another. And let's go back now and use, back to Romans 9, and let's use this in response to that. What shall we say then, right? Verse 14, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Remember, we talked about that last week. Partiality, hating one and loving another, say, exclusivity. These are unrighteousness. They're demonstrated as unrighteousness other places in the Bible. James tells us, you know, you may not have committed adultery, you may not have com committed murder, but if you have been partial if you've displayed partiality, you're guilty of the whole law. See, that's unrighteousness, isn't it? See what I'm saying? So if God was displaying partiality, Jacob, I loved and Esau, I hated, you know, in order to accomplish his purposes, Paul says, you know, what then? What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. Why? Again, because he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. So inclusion in the mercy of God is the story of this passage. And exclusion must always be understood, not to where you become hateful towards people who are, who are uh, 
embracing an exclusive message. But exclusion, we must understand, is always antichrist. It's always anti the effect of the word of God, right? Now, finally, okay, we get to this verse that speaks retribution to the fundamentalist evangelical judgment group, okay? The very verse, verse 22, the very verse that I had to do this whole chapter for because the word wrath pops up twice in it. So, but I couldn't go to verse 22 without doing the whole chapter, see? So, lucky you, you got everything I know about chapter 9. <laughs> and when I do this series again the next time, and it's 57 weeks long, you'll get the other stuff that I've learned since then. First time I did this series, it was six weeks long. And it was in response to the tsunamis in, in, uh, in uh, killing the people down in Indonesia and the pr local preachers around here and the television preachers talk about how that was the judgment of God on those pitiful people for their sin. So I did just a quick six-week thing and had to go back later on and throw it out because it was just so incomplete. This isn't complete either. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Come back another generation from now and hear what I have to say. No. But anyway, so finally, as I said, we get to this verse, you know, verse 22. All right, let's read it. For what if God, wanting to show his wrath and make his power known, endured with much long-suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? Let me go on. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. All right, so to begin sorting this out, to begin reversing our bias, as I've said several times in this passage, the first thing we have to realize is that from verse 22 through verse 24 is one long question. It's not a series of questions. It's one question, as Paul was prone to do. Make huge, long things, you know, like that, and then you have to try to follow it. Well, but it is. It's one long question. You see, the question mark is finally at the end of verse 24. It's not doesn't show up anywhere else, right? Okay, but anyway. <clears throat> okay, and within, within this one long question, the same humanity upon which the Word of God has taken effect is identified for us three times by, by three designations, right? Here's what we saw as we read this long question. This same humanity that we're talking about upon whom the word of God has taken effect is identified by three different designations, right? And yet it's the same humanity. First of all, we find in verse 22, vessels of wrath. Verse 23, we find vessels of mercy. Verse 24, we find Jews and also Gentiles, Right? So we have three different, three different identifiers here, but it's not three different groups. That's what you need to understand. It's not three groups. It's a unit. It's humanity. It's one. But yet he identifies humanity, vessels of wrath, vessels of mercy, made up of Jews and Gentiles. Okay? All right. So <clears throat> that alone, just that, what we've just acknowledged, should suggest that Maybe we've been misled by those words, God wanting to show his wrath <laughs> and make his power known. Maybe we've been misled. In other words, maybe it means something different than what we've thought it meant or what we've been taught it meant. God wanting to show his wrath and make his power known. Well, first of all, last week, we did, we, I think we proved from the passage here that God's power is mercy, that mercy is the power of God. It says the cross is the power of God, or the, power of the, uh, the message of the cross is the power of God to salvation, right? And what is the cross? The mercy seat. The cross is the mercy seat, where the blood was shed, see? The cross is the judgment seat of Christ, where he was judged in our behalf. The cross is the throne of grace to which we are to come and receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So the power of God to change humanity, to rescue and preserve humanity is what? The mercy of God. So we've got to understand that since we said that before. So as I said, maybe we've been misled here. Maybe we've understood something we weren't supposed to, right? All right. So let me say this first of all now. Verse 23 defines verse 22. So let me read this. That he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory. 
Wow. Now, here's the evangelically induced, confusing state of mind that God seems to be operating in as he speaks these things. Okay? It says, God desired to show his wrath to these vessels of wrath, these Baptists or Muslims. Let's use somebody that maybe we've acknowledged as vessels of wrath, the, the, the Muslims, okay? God desired to show his wrath on these vessels of wrath, but God also desired to make known the riches of glory on, on, the, on the vessels of mercy. This is a Jacob and Esau scenario still, right? <sighs> wow. Show my wrath. Make known the riches of my glory. Vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Vessels of mercy. Ah, oh, my goodness, whatever am I to do, I can't make up my mind. I know what I'll do. I'll leave it to the evangelicals and the fundamentalists, right, <laughs> to define my mixed emotions as two different groups of people. See? The ones who've not prayed the prayer, the ones I hate, the Esau's, and the ones who have prayed the prayer, the ones I love, the Jacob's. That's what I'll do. I'll leave it up to the evangelicals and the fundamentalists, and later on, they will figure out what I'm trying to declare here. And then he looks back on it, and he says, oh, my, 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 they have taken away the effect of the word of God. They did exactly what I thought they might do. They defined me as having mixed emotions. It wasn't mixed emotions. God is talking about the same group of people, and he is setting them up for a gospel, a message that's almost too good to be true. That's what he's doing, right? Now, so let's talk about, for just a couple minutes here, um, what this says. Now, we've talked previously, and some of you weren't here, and, and, uh, and some of you didn't hear me even though you were here. Some of you that are watching online, you didn't hear me the last time, I know, because I've gotten some questions from some of you, okay? We've talked previously about wrath, Greek word, orge, and we realized that it has two faces, both in life and on the pages of the Bible. Now, I want you to get this for two reasons, because I want to finish this chapter with this today, but also next week I'm going to deal with the two passages that seem to, that I purposely waited for a while on them, because I wanted to, as I said several weeks ago, wanted to lay a strong foundation for we got there. The passage in Ephesians 5, 6, and the passage in Colossians 3, 6, where it says, for this reason the wrath of God cometh upon the sons of disobedience. Those are the only two places other than Romans 1.18 where the wrath of God is actually in, in, in the, in the uh, print, in the scripture. The rest of the times, it's just wrath standing alone. Anyway, so let me say this again. And you need to get this for that reason as well as to, to sum up to this message today. But as I said, we've talked about wrath, or gay, and we have tried to reveal that it has two faces, right? Both in life and on the pages of the Bible. The first face is what man sees. The first face is what man perceives. Okay, that's the first face. Sin conscious man is what I'm talking about when I say man. Okay, and this is the face that was revealed to us in week five in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 27, where it says, a fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation. That is the expectation of guilt-laden, sin conscious, conscience-seared humanity. Okay, that's the first face that shows. The second face that shows in the scripture and in life when we're open to it is the face that God actually revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. Right? But here's been our problem. We have been unable to separate our, ang our language and our thoughts, you know, in order to embrace only God's wrath. And so every time we, I I've been reading some things recently online by people who are trying to explain these Verses that talk about the wrath of God. And the thing that I keep noticing is that they have not been able to separate. Now, remember how we separated vengeance? We saw what man's idea of vengeance was and what God's idea of vengeance was, right? Those were really clear, weren't they? Remember? Man's idea of vengeance is, is you cut them down. God's idea of vengeance is if they're hungry, feed them. If they're, you know what I'm saying? And then take care of them. And, and, and we, we did that all that work back there in Isaiah 54 to show that that whole idea of Hebraic wrath was totally, God totally disagreed with us. It said, that's never been me. But still people missed it. And so what I'm, what I'm seeing is that people are unable to separate, you know, their thoughts. And so when they talk about the wrath of God in these two or three passages that do exist, they 
feel like somehow or another they've got to bring in some retributive value. It may not be actually of God, but it's a retributive. Anyway, you know what? The problem needs to be resolved, and the only way it's going to be resolved is by realizing that we've got to separate our language, quit using hum- human language, and start going with the revealed language of God with regard to what wrath or gay means. So, listen to me one more time. Here's what or gay means. Don't worry about all the other crap that Strong's put in there, or Vines, or anybody else, about punishment and retribution. Because that's all human stuff that's helping create the mixture that people are struggling with. The word orge means hot, passionate pursuit, strong desire, reaching forth, reaching out after, to long for, to covet after intimacy. That's God's word, wrath. That's God's wrath, all right? Now, what is man's revelation of wrath? Fearful expectation of judgment, right? And fiery indignation. We hear it all the time. Most churches will preach it today. See? Most apocalyptic movies that will come out in the next year, we all will, 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 just, will preach it. See? Okay? So, but let's plug these two into this verse that we're reading right now. Let me just read it. You follow along. What if God, wanting to show, plug in ours, okay? What if God, wanting to show his passion, desire, longing, and, and coveting for, for intimacy, okay, endured with much long suffering the vessels of fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation. See, what we have right here, as I told you, we have two faces revealing themselves in Scripture on a regular basis. We see Scriptures that talk about, I'll talk more about it next week, but we see Scriptures that talk about, you know, wrath in the, uh, in the, in the seared conscious, you know, conscience sin conscious, you know, we see those scriptures, and we can't confuse them, we can't mingle them, we can't mix them, we've got to say, this is God, this is man, man's wrong, God's right, God's word is what we want to go with, not with man's word, right, okay, so what if God, wanting to show all this, right, okay, <clears throat> so just, just think about that a little bit, what if God, wanting to show his passion, desire, longing, coveting, uh, Coveting for intimacy with man and to make his power known. His what? What's his power? Mercy. And to make his mercy known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation. So here we have a side by side, a God and a man, face of wrath, right? Now listen, it doesn't make any sense. Think about this. It doesn't make any sense to say he endured with much long suffering if what he really wanted was to show his power in anger and retribution. Does it? Doesn't make any sense. He endured with much long-suffering, speaks to wanting to do what? Display mercy, not anger and retribution. That's why you endure, you know, say what I'm saying? Boy, when my kids used to, you know, be disobedient when they were little and everything, you know, it's too late. Social services can't come after me now. There's a, what was the word? Uh, yeah, statute of limitations. Boy, you know what? I wasn't enduring with long, much long suffering. I had a wrath I wanted them to share in. And it wasn't the hot, passionate, it got hot sometimes. <laughs> See what I'm saying? So it doesn't even make any sense for Paul to have said that if he's trying to communicate a retributive response from God. All right? So as I said, and you can do it yourself again, you know, verse 23 defines defines verse 22, so we'll just shorten it like this. God wanting to show his passion, his longing, his desire for intimacy with man, and to display his power in them, that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he, he, he had prepared beforehand, right? Now, just this quick little summation. Verse 22, notice, simply says, prepared for destruction. But in verse 23, it says, which he had prepared beforehand. So here's what we have. In verse 22, the word prepared is a different word than the word from verse 23. The word prepared in verse 22 means fitted for. Verse 23, the word means to ordain and prepare beforehand, right? In other words, verse 22 refers to what man does to himself in his sin-conscious, defiled conscience. He fits himself for destruction, right? Okay. Verse 23 refers to what God did for man. Oh, before there was man. Oops. 
prepared beforehand. So prepared in verse 23 trumps prepared in verse 22 every time. Understand that? So get this. God's wrath, or orge, is a passionate display of mercy upon those who've otherwise fitted themselves for destruction. Now, verses 25 and 26, just to end it up, as he, as he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who were not my people and her beloved who was not beloved, and it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, that they shall be called sons of the living God. And here's the last thing I want you to notice, because we, we already talked about how Paul contrasted it was said to her and as it is written in the earlier verses. Notice that Paul said here, as he says, referring to God. And then he goes on. He's, he's, in other words, he's validating Hosea's words to have been what God said. Amen?